There's a phrase that gets thrown around a lot these days, particularly in the longevity space. And that phrase is cheeky science. But there's another word you may also hear about, and that is epigenetic reprogramming. I'm guilty myself of throwing this word around without really explaining what it means. While I've discussed reprogramming before, I wanted to discuss in this video what is really meant by the phrase epigenetics. And it goes beyond me. Do you really know what's meant by that term? Well, hopefully by the end of this video, you will have at least my interpretation of this term. And in particular, I will focus mainly on the link between epigenetics, gene expression and cell identity. What makes a happy, healthy cell do what it does best? And I think by the end of it, you will have three main take homes. One, an appreciation of genome organisation and cell identity. Two, an overview of the different classes of epigenetics. And three, the sort of modern day look at things and epigenetic reprogramming. Now, my epigenetic journey began when I read this book about eight years ago. But instead, before you go running off to the bookstore, I think it's better we start with a little bit of maths. You see, within each of our cells, we have three billion base pairs of DNA. So the A's, T's, C's and G's. Given that each base is 0.6 nanometers in length, if we multiply that by 3 billion, we end up with 1.8 meters, a number we can actually process. And so, you know, that's about two meters of DNA. And that's got to get not just into each of our cells, but into the nucleus of our cells. So like imagine the tallest person you know, and then imagine them stood on some stilts, and then that length getting squashed, not only into one cell, but into the nucleus of one cell. So how? Well, it's not just scrunched up into a ball and like... Another job well done. But it's also not a rigid architecture perfectly aligned to every nanometer. That's not to say it's a mess. It's highly structured and organised, yet it is dynamic. It can be changed. What that is all meant to say is that the 3D organisation of how this DNA is packaged is important. And so here it goes. Firstly, the DNA is wrapped around proteins called histones, which form structures called nucleosomes. And we can also call this as chromatin. Now, this works because these histone proteins have an abundance of positively charged amino acids, which attract them to the negative backbone of DNA. What, at an uncompacted level, looks like beads in a string, can then get coiled, folded and looped to form more compressed layers of chromatin, which are further packaged to form chromosomes. We have 23 pairs of chromosomes, and all of these undergo this packaging process. And while you can draw these chromosomes out in a linear manner, due to this folding, it means that regions that are far away can actually interact. You're just not thinking fourth dimensionally. Right, right, I have a real problem. Well, at least three-dimensionally for now. And each chromosome can be mapped, and it has been observed that each of them has its own territory. Another point to reinforce is that this process is not homogeneous. There are some parts of chromatin that are more open, and some parts that are more tightly repressed. So there are some highly interacting hubs, like a city, and other areas where less contacts are made. But what are the implications of this packaging? Well, packaging does indeed come with consequences. DNA, with our genetic information, is now tightly packaged into the nucleus. Brilliant. But the more tightly DNA is packaged up in this chromatin, the less accessible the DNA sequence becomes. And DNA has our information. For example, DNA is important for transcription, the initial stage of gene expression. The machinery that facilitates this process needs sequence-specific information to ensure that it initiates at the correct place. And so depending on which regions are more open, therefore influences where gene expression is more likely to happen. What genes are expressed influences what the cell does, and therefore what identity we give to the cell, be it by calling it a neuron or a skin cell. So this begs the question of, how is it decided what areas are more open and more compressed? And while decided isn't a good word for me to use here, instead I prefer the phrase, what are the regulatory mechanisms in place, and what does one refer to as these mechanisms? Well, evidently there is additional information that goes beyond the DNA sequence that is required, as all cells in our body have the same DNA sequence, yet they are expressing different genes. And so this brings us back to trying to define epigenetics. So to just give a definition of epigenetics then, 
It is heritable information that can be found on top of the genomic sequence and those marks are modifiable. Key for interpretation here is the word heritable and for the remainder of this video we'll look at some of these types of epigenetic marks and how they are modifiable. So the first class of epigenetic marks we'll look at are modifications to these histone proteins that are involved in packaging DNA into the nucleus. These histone proteins have tails and these tails can undergo various modifications such as acetylation and methylation. These are just chemical modifications that can influence the compaction of chromatin and the accessibility of DNA sequences for transcription. For example, acetylation of histone tails is generally associated with more open chromatin structure and increased transcription, while methylation can lead to more compact chromatin and decreased transcription. And when a cell replicates, not only is DNA replicated, but these histone proteins are also displaced, new proteins are made, and then they're reincorporated, but the new histone proteins must also regain these epigenetic marks. I won't go into the mechanism here, but the appreciation is that these marks are indeed heritable as a cell divides. But they can also be modified by other proteins that can add or remove these different modifications. Another epigenetic modification that involves methylation that influences how genes are expressed isn't on histone proteins, but on DNA itself. This is referred to as DNA methylation. And when it comes to longevity, you've most likely already heard of it. And so DNA methylation is cool and complex, although, well, no, no, not quite the complexity of histone modifications. As here, it mainly refers to methylation of the cytosine, the C residue of DNA. Most of these marks are seen when cytosine is adjacent to guanine, G. In our cells, we have a sort of bimodal landscape of these marks, where there are sites where there are low density of these CG sequences, and they tend to be methylated, whereas high density regions called CG islands tend to be not methylated, so hypomethylated. And then looking at the presence or absence of methylation at some of these sites has been seen to correlate with age, which is what you may have heard of in terms of epigenetic age or DNA methylation age tests. And I've shown them in different videos before. But the caveat at the moment, which we'll come back to later more generally, is that it is unclear what these marks are doing and how the cell reads the information of DNA methylation. But generally speaking, methylation, of course, changes the chemistry of the base and hence what proteins can bind to certain regions, how packaged the chromatin is, and as we've already discussed, what genes are subsequently going to be expressed. So it's another class of epigenetic mark. And then the third class of epigenetic marks are RNAs. This is probably the coolest area of epigenetics. I mean, I'm joking, they're all pretty cool. But these RNAs have been of particular interest for understanding transgenerational information inheritance. But I will briefly skim over it here because there are many types of RNAs, from small RNAs to long non-coding RNAs, and hence there are many different mechanisms in which they can influence gene expression. But broadly speaking, these RNAs can interact with protein components that affect gene expression, both at the level of DNA packaging, but also at the messenger RNA level, a stage of gene expression during translation. RNA can also directly bind RNA or DNA due to complementary base pairing. And so this enables site-specific regulation. And another feature is that these RNAs many of them hang out in the cytoplasm of all places and because they're in the cytoplasm they can get passed on via cell division like how many other organelles like mitochondria are passed on hence why it's also been of interest for understanding transgenerational inheritance so those are the three main classes of epigenetics protein based dna based and rna based and these dictate cell identity well apart from the one obvious tiny little baby little hiccup what actually dictates what marks are present and where they're present? Like, why should lysine 26 of histone protein 3 at genomic locus chromosome 6, 165700 be cislated? Well, there are proteins that modify these marks, and they can get recruited to genomic loci through interacting with current epigenetic marks and other proteins bound at that site. But this, what comes first, cause versus consequence, is still undetermined in the field, but to dwell a little bit longer on these chromatin modifiers, that now brings us full circle to touch upon epigenetic reprogramming, since I mentioned it at the start of the video.
For the case of going to a stem cell from a skin cell, one can employ the so-called Yamanaka factors. These are four transcription factors that, by influencing gene expression, can reprogram the set of epigenetic marks present. How exactly, again, is not understood fully, and one could talk about whether transcription factors are more important than epigenetic marks, which leads us on to pioneer factorizability, and ultimately I could talk about P53 for half now if you wanted. And while I joke around as usual and make it sound like we know how all this stuff works, this really is sort of the cutting edge stuff at the moment of what scientists are trying to do. And that's been fueled by some pretty good advances in the tools used to make these discoveries, thanks to next generation sequencing technologies and some very clever assays such as high C chromatin capture, chip sequencing, ATAC sequencing, and the ability to also do this on a single cell level. That said, we tend to study these marks in isolation, whereas there is much interplay across these different types of epigenetic marks. But I hope this video has given you a better understanding of what epigenetics is and that Hopefully you can agree with me that it is fascinating, plus it also relates somewhat to my own PhD work. And given that I also think small RNAs are fascinating, perhaps I will touch upon transgenerational epigenetics in an upcoming video. Well, maybe, we'll see. But in the meantime, you can learn about epigenetic reprogramming here. So with that, thank you to my Patreon supporters and thank you for listening.